Welcome to the romantic bicentennial celebration of the 1819 publication of Percy Bysshe Shelley's The Cenci. This is a really exciting event, and it's been sponsored by the Keats Shelley Association of America, Western University, and Brescia University College School of Humanities. So I want to thank all of those people. Plus, I would like to thank our wonderful director, Joe Devereaux, who has worked very hard to make this production come to life. So one of the reasons this is an important event is because this is a very important play. Many writers, famous writers that you've heard of from the 19th century singled it out as one of the finest plays of the 19th century. None other than William Wordsworth said it was the greatest tragedy of the age. Byron con concurred. Mary Shelley said it was Shelley's finest writing. George Bernard Shaw said it was the greatest play of the century and went on to stage it. And it was not staged publicly until 1891, where it was first performed in Paris, not in England, and it was not staged publicly in England until 1922, more than, two, more than 100 years after it was first published. And that's not what the Shelleys thought would happen because Percy Bysshe Shelley and Mary Shelley were actually collaborating on this. They wrote it together. He wrote it, he was the primary author, but she collaborated on it with him more than she did on any of his other works. They discussed the scenes, she helped re rewrite the dialogue, and they were convinced it was going to be a popular success. The story, which is a real historical story, was already very popular in Italy where they lived. So it was quite a surprise. Now, the reasons why this very important and very beautiful play were not staged are complex, and I'm gonna to touch on those tonight. But mostly I'm going to connect in a kind of a thematic way this play with some of our current debate and discussion around sexual violence. And uh, several characters in this play, oops, <laughs> So the main theoretical focus, the main literary critical focus on this play has been whether or not Beatrice is guilty or justified. And there has been a mountain of criticism written on this topic. So much so that whether, and this is a spoiler, uh, I assume some of you have not read the play before. How many have not read or seen the play before? Okay, so most of you have, well that's good. So there won't be too many spoilers here. So her decision to have her father assassinated is considered by a lot of critics as a crime, as something that shows her guilt, and by a lot of critics as entirely justified by his abuse. Okay, so that's the big issue in literary criticism. I think Beatrice is undoubtedly the emotional center of the play, but there's a more interesting way to look at it than that. And that is to focus more on what Beatrice says and how she says it, more on what she experiences and how she experiences it, which are really the focal point. Now, in the wake of the Me Too movement, the historical moment of the play may have arrived. Tonight, I hope to show you how this play is resonant with today's discussions around these issues. So I'm going to look at four things. The first thing I want to talk about is bystander disbelief, which is in the play. The second thing I'm going to talk to you about is the issue of consent, what it is and what it isn't. Number three, I would like to touch on briefly the domestic abuse of the stepmother, Lucretia. And finally, the topic that is most taboo and may have had the biggest part in the censorship of the play, the topic of, and I say it with a little bit of apprehension because the word is very strong, but the topic of rape. So first off, let's talk about disbelieving the woman because the entire act one sets this up as the context for the tragic action. Shelley's play was ahead of its time and possibly ahead of ours in vindicating the legitimacy of women's experiences of assault and abuse. It dramatizes disbelief, 
which plagued allegations, especially allegations against powerful and wealthy men. Several characters do not believe Count Chenchi to be as reprobate as we, the audience, know he is. The play opens with a conversation between Count Chenchi and Cardinal Camillo. And in this conversation, Chenchi brags about his crimes. He says, I did all these things. And the response of the cardinal is, I thank my God that I believe you not. So this is interesting because Car Cardinal Camillo is a pretty sympathetic character. He's benevolent. He's well-meaning. And the, the person, the criminal, has just confessed to him quite openly. And he says he doesn't believe it. That's where we begin. I think Shelley shows the way in which well-meaning and benevolently disposed people uh, protect themselves psychologically from thinking about or believing things they don't want to think about. Later, Orsino in the same act converses with Beatrice, and he says to us in a soliloquy, then as to what she suffers from her father, in all this there is much exaggeration. Interesting. He goes on to explain that ordinary drinking, losing one's temper, adultery, etc., normal activities, um, are called foul tyranny by their families, by their wives and daughters. So that's interesting because Orsino is Beatrice's friend. Orsino is not Count Chenchi's friend. Orsino is in love with Beatrice, and yet he doesn't believe that she suffers the crimes that she suffers. And we have to ask ourselves if this kind of disbelief is gendered, whether it's because Orsino is a man. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems plausible that might be one explanation for taking the side of the man who isn't, after all, his friend. In the third scene, Count Chenchi tells his friends and family not to credit gossips and rumor about him. Okay, he says, uh, just don't listen to what people say. And then there are a whole bunch of guests at the banquet, and the first guest says that he seems too lighthearted and companionable to act the deeds that rumor pins on you. Then he openly admits to crimes and brags about the desire he had to see his own sons murdered. And a third guest says, I do believe it is some jest. I see it is only raillery by his smile. So at this point, Beatrice, the only person to stand up to her father, expostulates to the guests that they protect her mother, her brother, and her, that they take them away somewhere safe. And the guests refuse to act on their behalf. And the reasons are established in the play as a complex mix mixture of disbelief on the one hand and also fear of Count Chenchi's power and of his violence, his violent nature. The celebration ends with the guests leaving and Chenchi's parting words are, I will not make you longer spectators of our dull domestic quarrels. So I think what we see here are several factors that keep him from being held to account for his crimes. A combination of his power, the auditor's disbelief, the trivializing effect of that word, domestic. The implication is that an outsider cannot begin to understand an angry daughter's outbursts at her father, which he minimizes by saying, our dull family quarrels. With that one little word, domestic, Count Chenchi neutralizes what is a serious and life-threatening predicament for Beatrice and Lucretia. So Act One sets up the disbelief and inaction, which are the context for the tragedy. And, in, uh, and the second thing I want to discuss tonight is consent. Now, the word consent comes from the Latin word consensus, meaning con, together, or with, and census, agreement. So to agree together, to agree with. 
interesting in this play of 1819 that consent is explicitly thematized. The very opening sentence of the play uses the word. Camillo says to Count Cenci, that matter of the murder is hushed up. If you consent to yield his holiness, your fief that lies beyond the Pincian gate. In other words, the Pope will forgive Count Cenci his crime of murder if he gives up a large portion of his land to the Vatican. This is historical, by the way. This really happened. This is Pope Clement VIII, and it's a matter of historical record that Count Cenci paid off these crimes to the Pope through land and money. It's not, in this case, a reference to sexual violence, but it does set up this idea of consent between a powerful figure, the Pope, and a less powerful figure, Count Cenci, whose the more powerful figure is taking something away from the less powerful figure. The second time consent is mentioned is specifically in the context of sexual violence. And it's when Count Cenci has his wife, Lucretia, call Beatrice to him. He says, go thou quick, Lucretia, tell her to come, and yet let her understand that her coming is consent. Moreover, that if she come not, I will curse her. Now, you'll notice that it's Chenchi's emphasis on consent, because he tells us he, it's not enough for him simply to defile her body. He has to corrupt her will. No, tis her stubborn will, which by its own consent shall stoop as low as that which drags it down. Now, clearly, this is not a valid conception of consent, agreeing together because he issues it as a demand with both explicit and implicit threats. So that's not consent. Even if Chen Qi's understanding of consent were valid, and it is not, Beatrice refuses to grant it. Lucretia says of Beatrice, she said, I cannot come. Go tell my father that I see a torrent of his own blood raging between us. The second time Chen Qi demands her present and implied consent, Lucretia replies, she bids thee curse. And if thy curses, Chen Qi breaks off, interrupts his wife in the middle of her sentence and says, she would not come. Tis well, I can do both. First, take what I demand and then extort concession. Concession, like consent, by definition, cannot be extorted. Psychologically, I don't know a lot about this topic, but it is apparently true that psychologically, abusers do convince themselves that their victims either consent or at least concede. And this is inaccurate. Now, Stuart M. Sperry is a very fine Shelley critic, and I recommend him. But he makes a mistake, I believe, when he says that Beatrice's tragic flaw is her idealization of her virginity. In the historical material, which the Shelleys adhered to scrupulously, Beatrice Chenchi was not a virgin at the time of her molestation. She had had a lover. Nor do the words virgin, virginity, chaste, chastity appear anywhere in the text of the play. The word pure is applied to Beatrice, but it's most often applied to her after the violation. Also, in other Shelley poems, explicitly sexual heroines are described as pure. Okay, so it's not uncommon for him to, to have uh, a sexual heroine that he uses that word pure for. In the greatest assertion of Beatrice's purity, Cardinal Camillo says, she is as pure as speechless infancy, and it's after the crime. 
There's all the difference in the world, in other words, with due respect to Stuart M. Sperry, between consensual and non-consensual sexual activity. And Beatrice has trauma because of violence, not because of sexual activity. Consent, in other words, is far more important to the drama's ethics than is chastity. And resembling other heroic and sexual Shelley heroines, it is impossible for me to imagine Beatrice as capable of fetishizing her virginity. In fact, it's not just an assault. We're led to believe that she experiences the worst kind of brutality. Whatever occurs off stage between act two and act three is too horrible for her to even fathom. And she is already a much abused, frequently beaten daughter. And she cannot articulate it. It's ghastly enough to bring on a fit of madness. The Shelleys understood more about sexual assault than one would expect from a play written so long ago. The third thing I want to talk to you about is domestic abuse. Act two focuses on Chenchi's abusiveness toward his wife, Lucretia. This is a relationship entirely overlooked in the commentary on the play. You know, there are mountains and reams, and this is a highly canonical text, even if it isn't much performed. And uh, many critics have written on it, but somehow Lucretia is left out of the equation. And yet she's a seriously important character who speaks a lot of lines, who is uh, crucial to the play's action. And it act two opens when she is just being hit by her husband. Act one, scene one, has her saying to her stepson, Bernardo, weep not, my gentle boy. He struck but me. One of the saddest lines in the whole play. It was only me who have borne deeper wrongs. In truth, if he had killed me, he had done a kinder deed. That's where act two opens. She has many of the traits that have now been classified in the 20th century under a diagnostic label called abused wife syndrome or abused spouse syndrome. She has learned helplessness. She has a death wish. She's more concerned for her stepson than for herself. She's more concerned for her abuser than for herself. She takes a great deal of trouble to try and save him. She has false hopes, which Beatrice doesn't share. Beatrice is very clear-eyed. She has false hopes that Chenchi will rectify his behavior, that he'll repent. It is an understatement to say that critics are not enamored of Lucretia. If they talk about her at all, it's to disparage her. And yet, even in the preface and throughout the play, Shelley emphasizes the naturalness and the sweetness of her disposition. Her passivity, in other words, according to this diagnostic label that we now have available to us, is something that happens to even bold and confident women if they suffer long-term violent abuse. It's a learned behavior and an inevitable response to a life permeated by fear. Now, Beatrice Chenchi is her champion. She champions her stepmother against the abuser. And this is interesting biographically because, of course, Mary Shelley's own mother, the famous feminist, Mary Wollstonecraft, had that role in relation to her own violently abusive father, that Mary Wollstonecraft defended her mother against his attacks. In a contemporary court of law, in many Western democracies, including our own, a plausible plea of self-defense would work for Lucretia. In other words, battered wife syndrome as a psychological disorder, if it's proven by a defense team that the woman realistically fears murder, which there is no doubt in this play that you know, he threatens to kill her and he's already killed her sons. And, you know, it's just, 
is totally credible. And that also the plaintiff has sought but not found protection in the law. And there are many attempts, Beatrice and Lucretia have made many attempts to seek protection from the law and from the church. Thereby, Lucretia learns that the only freedom from her abuser will be her death or his. And therefore, it wouldn't even be a lesson charge. It wouldn't go from first degree to second degree to manslaughter. No, she would be acquitted. She would be deemed under current laws as innocent, something that was not the case in 1819. So the final thing I want to talk to you about is that ugly little R word. That word, rape, is never mentioned in the text. We are never explicitly told what happens to Beatrice. And yet, spectators and audiences, literary critics, accept the reality of the crime. It turns out to be a much easier thing to do to prove that crime in an art work, in a work of art, than it is to prove it in a court of law. We do accept that it occurs off stage between Act Two and Act Three. Don't worry, you won't see this in the play. What we do know is that the historical record vindicates that this happened. So history is on Shelley's side, uh, that the crime is well publicized as a historical fact. There are different reasons why the word doesn't occur in the text or, for that matter, any other synonymous words or phrases. Nothing is said explicitly. At one point, we find out that the unspoken word itself carries with it its own violence before Beatrice is even violated. Lucretia asks her, what can have subdued Beatrice's hitherto firm mind? Beatrice replies, speaking very slowly with a forced calmness. It was one word, mother, one little word. The little word, I argue, is probably not sex or incest or violence or any other word, but the more visceral R word. Beatrice is unable at any point in the action to say it out loud. Why? Well, at this point, it's just a menace, not yet enacted. But it's a one word that's so powerful that it makes her half mad. One reason why she doesn't say the word is there are no words adequate to represent this violence. But she's also silent because of other reasons. One is to protect her stepmother. Ah, no, tis nothing new, she says to Lucretia. The sufferings we all share have made me wild. He only struck me and cursed me as he passed. He said he looked, he did nothing at all beyond his wont, yet it disordered me. Alas, I am forgetful of my duty. I should preserve my senses for your sake. So this is typical of victims too, a desire to protect friends and loved ones when added to bystander disbelief and a lack of legal redress. These are compelling reasons for silence. But there's more to it in Beatrice's case. She is afraid of the word. The word itself is dangerous to her, she leads us to believe. I call it her logophobia, the Greek word meaning fear of words, which is actually a pretty common theme in Shelley. Or you could call it post-traumatic word repression. After she has actually suffered the crime, she says to Lucretia, who's saying, what happened? What happened? You know, what's going on? What happened? And she says to her, what are the words which you would have me speak? Of all words that minister to mortal intercourse, which wouldst thou hear? 
Beatrice later tells us about that word's power to tarnish her reputation for future ages and to drag her name through the mud. Her stepmother's name, interestingly enough, Lucretia, reminds us of that little word because there is a very famous Lucretia, the wife of a Roman senator who historically was raped by the son of an Etruscan prince and is immortalized throughout art as the rape of Lucretia, the title of a famous poem by Shakespeare, the title of many famous paintings, including one by Titian, which the Shelleys would have seen in Venice. And all of this means that the word is kind of lurking there under the, we can't forget about the existence of the word even though we don't hear it. The Shelleys vehemently opposed 19th century marriage laws and customs that which gave legal custody and indeed ownership of women's bodies to husbands and fathers. In conclusion, I hope you agree with me that Shelley's play was ahead of its time. It discusses credibly and with psychological astuteness the social disbelief of victims, the consequent lack of redress, consent, what it is, and there are other references to consent in the play, and what it isn't domestic abuse, and finally, the crime that Beatrice does not want to say out loud, and that the play does not say out loud. Politically, the play is a potent critique of both church and state for their shared failure to protect women from domestic abuse and sexual violence. And the reasons for this repression of the play that it's not often performed, go beyond the taboo themes of incest and parricide. I would argue that there are also concerns about the threat to political establishments, to political power in the form, including, not limited to, but including their aristocracy, the church, patriarchy, wealth, all of these are still, um, is still very difficult to challenge. Finally, my argument is that the Chenchi's focus is not the parasite. The parasite is less significant than the emotional and physical experiences of Beatrice and the other suffering family members. And these really are the source of its pathos and its power. Thank you. <laughs>